Welcome to this exploration and indeed celebration of the Battalion Combat series of games. Today, we're going to have a look at Command. I think one of the most interesting and difficult aspects of the game to get your mind around. The game series gives you these fascinating operational challenges, and I'm really excited to see a number of uh, interesting areas being explored for future releases. But Command, well, Combat is like, you know, the champagne moments. We all get excited by combat, but command is that focus on what am I going to do and when am I going to do it? And when you've looked through this video, I think, I hope that you're going to have a much stronger sense of how to control the tempo of the game. What missions can you realistically set for your formations? And we're going to use several different real life examples for that. What kind of rhythm of play turn after turn should you focus on in order to keep this command focus and then finally at some of the game specific situations which uh, control or tweak the command arrangements that you have to work under commands should be easy you know push unit a to go to place b but of course as Clausewitz noted so long ago, everything is very simple, but the simplest thing is very difficult. BCS captures friction so well in stopping us executing our perfect plans. I'm using the lens of command because although combat is super exciting, there is something like 28 different rule systems within the game to get from the page into at least my tiny mind. And it helps if I have some sort of overarching structure to say, oh, well, this belongs there and this is about this. So in command, I'm meaning really the ordering of your formations to do particular missions uh, and what limitations around them. In the future, I'll do some videos on communications, control and intelligence to round out the whole C3I concepts, which I assume we're all familiar with. But in thinking about command, I'm thinking about number one, set your mission for your formation. Now you can do this mentally. Formation A goes to destination Z, but much better to use the optional orders system. It's the simplest order system in the world. You either say do nothing or prepare defense or recover, or you give a hex destination to where you want the formation to eventually go to. Next thing under command is what units to activate and how much of an activation do you get through snafu so it's organizing your formations uh, orchestrating them what comes first what comes second and so on thirdly fourthly and fifthly there's how much of a offensive defensive posture how far are you going to stretch yourself into the future by setting recon objectives or are you going to do a concentrated attack or a dispersed one or are you planning a defense and is that defense just quite passive or is it an active defense with a little bit of uh, objective setting? Next up, there is the, the unity of the formation itself through the command radius. So how do you keep everything together? Then how do you stop your individual formations from getting out of control? Uh, or being not being able to be supported through the uh, the safe path rules. And then finally, how do you keep those units, uh, their resilience strong, so that they don't lose steps that eventually will make them combat ineffective? So this is the, the chunk of rules I'm going to explore, but not on a explaining the rules basis kind of way. Instead, I want to look at some of the challenges that the game offers. So, I mean, here is one of the almighty challenges, the beginning of Brazen Chariots. The 7th Armored Division, which is here, 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 and here, have this big open space in which to go and do something. And it's a huge challenge. You've got 15th Panzer and 21st Panzer, Ariati, and Vekman's uh, screens over here. But what are you going to do? And this isn't just a problem for us. It was a problem for these chaps as well. In fact, we have an advantage. We don't have to agree with five other people what we're going to do, unlike these guys who had to come up with some sort of operational plan 
and who had very different and diverging agendas. So first of all, you have uh, Goodwin Austin in charge of the 13th Corps down on the wire. He was very keen on protecting his flank so that he wasn't taken in the flank by the Panzer Divisions and got the commander of the 7th Armoured Division in the final version of the plan, had to push one of his armoured brigades to do that. Secondly, there was the option that no one took up of just taking the entire 7th Army and smacking its head against two Panzer Divisions. Unsurprisingly, no one thought that was a good idea. So, but, you know, it's an option. It's an option for you. You can do that. Thirdly, there was the idea, particularly put forward by Norrie, the 30th Corps commander, that they should basically do a runner for Trebrook, encourage uh, Scobie, the fortress commander, to break out whilst they got to Tidi Raij. This being interesting both because it's very close to Trebrook and it has one of the few bits of terrain in the entire map with the escarpment which uh, runs along there which would give some measure of flank protection. Fourthly, you could go off and attack Ariette, brush that aside, and then this road coming up from the south is in fact the shortest route on the map to Trebrook, and again, get uh, Gobi to help break out that as well. And again, Paul Gott was asked to contribute another of his brigades to deal with Ariette. And then fifthly, Cunningham, the new 8th Army commander, indeed the whole 8th Army was new, it had been the Western Desert Force before, fresh from his successes East, East Africa, but not a very well man, his bright idea was just to move the 7th Armoured Division to here, go equivalent to prepared defence, and wait for the uh, Panzers to come along and uh, have a go at him if they're hard enough. So lots of options. The things you have to think about is, well, first of all, which direction are you going to choose? The British Commonwealth Army plan was not the best, it has to be said, because it had got going in four different directions simultaneously. Of course, what snafus are you going to get? You simply don't know. And what order are you going to activate these different brigades? And how are you going to use these objectives or prepared defense or your recon to push it out further? The command radius is something to bear in mind. This is a big piece of desert. Uh, you should be okay for safe path and isolation. It's pretty hard to trap people in brazen chariots. You have to go out on a long, long limb before that becomes a problem. Although, Potentially, that is a problem for the route number three, City Rezij, because your 7th Armoured is here, your Trebrook is there, and your supply is down on the edge of the map. Perhaps most importantly, and underthought about, is what are you going to do when the 7th Armoured Division runs out of puff, which is likely to be in four or five days. I'll go into this a little bit more in the future. But where is going to be a safe place? where they can lager down and recover for a turn or two once they've got to fatigue three, or indeed four, if things go very badly. So that's the kind of head expanding choices that we have to, uh, to think about. Before I go in to explore how to get some rules of thumbs about what your choices could be, uh, Carl Fung very helpfully in the Facebook group noted that this particular problem was fraught with extra difficulties. So he pointed out the fragility of these armoured brigades. They're all quite small, so if any of them takes quite a few lumps, it seriously degrades the ability of the whole brigade. Secondly, he pointed out that orchestration is really hard, which one comes out when. Now, this partly depends on what activation system you use. My gaming group favours the chips in a bag and you pull out three, and the side with two on their side gets to pick one of the two, but that's pretty random. Uh, others may just favor the classic I go, you go system. That obviously makes it easier to orchestrate which ones come along, but even so, it still can be tricky. 
and you may find yourself having to react to something that uh, the axis has done when actually your plan had to be, you know, this formation, this formation, this formation. Vulnerability, the Seventh Army is just, you know, a bit vulnerable. Uh, although it's larger, substantially larger than either of the two Panzer Divisions, it still is not able to take on both. And particularly if one of the brigades gets separated from uh, the rest of the division, it, it could probably be almost annihilated or at least seriously knocked about. And then finally, you've got Rommel coming along. And when he does, their ability to activate gets much increased. And the speed at which they can guarantee a high tempo of operations is uh, really solid. They still will feel fatigue, though they will wear out. But before they do that, they, they may well run amok a bit. And it's not the only challenge within the game. In fact, all of the games feature a significant challenge. Here we are in Panzerslaus Stand. And I just wanted to highlight the position of the 18th Tank Corps in its strange startup position, because this is a real challenge for command for this chap, whose name might be pronounced. General Leuchtenant Govorunenko. Thank you, Google Translate. His command. Good news, his MSR is not blocked. His command radius and safe path uh, cover half of his division, but not the other half. You'll notice the safe path for leg is actually bigger in most cases than your safe path for tracked MPs and truck MPs. And these guys are very vulnerable and actually very exciting for the Germans, particularly this five factor three-step tank brigade, which is probably, I think, the single most powerful Russian unit on the game, or certainly the single most powerful one that starts. So the job of this 18th Tank Corps at the beginning is to move the HQ down here up as far as possible and move these guys back as far as possible to at least create a safe path but you won't be within a uh, command radius. It'll take a second turn to bring them back into command radius. And of course, whilst that happens, quite a lot of negative things are happening to the 18th Corps. So first of all, the movement is restricted. You can either stay where they are, which is, you know, one potential thing because they are blocking the main road and the uh, SS Panzer Divisions would love to come swanning along here. But if you do move them, you can only move them towards the HQ. Obviously, they're not going to get any replacements. And if they stay in this place, they are going to suffer two step losses, one for safe path and one for outer command. So if you move them back into just being with no safe path, at least you limit the step loss to one. This poor chap, who is leg and truck, has all of these negatives, plus he can't be in prepared defense, he can't get any new support. Now, actually, he's an AV unit, so he can't get support, but if he wasn't, if he's forced to retreat, he loses a step, and he can't flip over to his move side. I don't think he has a move side, I think he's support on the other side. Um, basically, he's a one-step unit, and he's not long for this world, so you don't have to worry about him. But these two are of great interest to any Russian commander. And the first decision they have to make is, do they let them stay and take big losses? So for this unit, it would destroy it. Two-step losses, it's only a two-step. For this one, two-step losses would mean that it um, is reduced to one and therefore very vulnerable to any German attack. So although it, Ideally, it would be lovely to leave them there. It, in practice, would be a, uh, a death knell for that group of forces, assuming, of course, that they had to activate. And there's a thing that if the Germans don't activate them by attacking them and forcing a step loss, the Russians could just not activate it and avoid these losses. It's one of the peculiarities of the Panzer's Last Stand rules. So just to focus a little bit more on 
what happens when your command is degraded, your operations are severely limited if you have units out of command. You see it in um, Last Blitzkrieg, uh, as well as in Passage Last Stand. And then they're further degraded if you are so out of command that you are no longer in contact with your HQ. And the only thing that you can do is either stay where you are, don't move, or fight your way back. But your fighting your way back can't be uh, cheeky. You can't use it to block enemy MSRs or jump HQs and things like that. You're purely retreating, I think is the, uh, the word you'd like to use. I want to focus next on the, the sequence of play because having this kind of command mindedness, I think benefits from having that focus all the way through. So, right, first of all, in your pre-turn phase, you have your orders. If you don't use orders, do. Uh, it will, it, it isn't just a good technique in itself. It just makes you pause, what makes me pause, and think about the situation in the round at the beginning of every turn, because otherwise there's this temptation to just beetle in and move that formation and that formation and not take a pause and think about, well, how is this all going? How am I doing against whatever my master pan is? How am I achieving victory here? Having done your orders, do your activations, your formation selection, whether you actively pick them at random or choose them on an I go, you go uh, basis, then have this measure of, well, how much do I get? And when you're doing the orders, it's really helpful to think, how much can I reasonably expect from my snafus? And I'll talk about that in a moment. Setting your objectives and then doing the do, moving and fighting and reconning and all the rest of it. And then if there's something important to do, rinse and repeat with your second activation. I said, I would look at what could be a rule of thumb or what can you expect from an individual formation. So I've picked five kind of notional example formations, a super brilliant one, the best of the best, uh, possibly with some uh, game specific rule, that's GRS there, or with a Rommel or some such thing. You know, they've got some pluses on their side and they're good anyhow. And then you know, a really good division without those extra bonuses. And then a, you know, perfectly capable and competent division, and then a very poor one, and then a shockingly awful one. Against these notional five different kinds of divisions, the first question I wanted to ask is, what's just the straightforward chance of getting a second activation? And the thing that strikes me is even the super division, has nearly a one in five chance of not getting a second activation. Obviously 83% is pretty hot and you may want or expect that to happen, but there's still, you know, reasonably high chance of that not taking place. When you get to just a gratuitously good division, 66%, two out of three times. So a one in three chance of failing. A perfectly satisfactory division that, you know, most people would be fine to have in their line, just a 50-50. You know, this is not great. And then it gets into silly numbers when it gets down to poor and awful. Now, looking at this yellow number, the 83, the 66, etc., what is the chance then of having that as one of these results? So. What's the chance of me having a good full activation and then a second activation? So this is back in my orders planning thing when I'm trying to think, well, this formation could do that and this formation could do that before you've actually activated them. So you've got nearly a 70% chance with this super great division of having a full activation and then successfully having a second activation, whatever the snafu is on that second activation. And it goes down on this excellent division to just over 50%. And only 29% for this, I've called it neutral, but actually it's still pretty fine. And then, you know, shockingly poor down there. Getting a partial, which, you know, certainly for our key divisions, 
I would think of as being a bit meh. Uh, and a second activation is a significant result all the way through. Uh, luckily, you don't need to deploy your swearing skills because for these two divisions, you can't fail. And even for these, the chances of having a fail and also a second activation is low because their chances of getting a second activation is low. So realistically, it's only these two types of divisions that you can count on of having any kind of good result and a second activation. And it's pretty chancy here with this middling division. What would that second activation look like? Well, your chances of getting two full activations on this brilliant division is only 58%. It's not a surefire thing at all. You know, you have to combine three die rolls. The first snafu, the second activation die roll, the second activation snafu, and that leaves you with 58% on this unit that's got a plus three on its snafu and a plus one on its second activation. Likewise, with this good division, it's just under 50%. And for this middling division, it falls to only a one in five chance, less than one in five chance. So when you get a full and a partial with these three top divisions, you shouldn't be too sad about it. It is the odds that is a pretty likely result if you get this second activation. Remember, this is 23% of 50%. You've got a full 50% chance of it not happening at all. Down here, you're kind of into silly numbers and uh, being a bit fluky about the whole thing. Obviously, if you get two partials with one of these Uber divisions, you do, you know, have a right to, you know, your bottom lip trembling a little bit, you know, it's all a bit unfair. Now, this for me generates a few rules of thumb. So first of all, these great divisions, they are not cast iron. They cannot get these double activations at a matter of course. You are really on a 50% chance and only a one in five chance for a normal good division. Don't be too upset if you just get a full and a partial because, you know, that's, that's going pretty well as well. And then notice these high percentages of not getting second activation. I'm certainly guilty of throwing a few dice uh, across the room in disgust as my activations have gone poorly a few times. And I think it's partly because I'm not aware of this. Let's flip over to the other question. Because yes, there's the snafu and the second activation question, but there's also the fatigue question, which is at the other end of the uh, the turn sequence. This uh, chap is General Mark uh, Hurtling, former US Army commander of Europe back in 2011-12. He's one of the chaps I follow on Twitter. His analysis of the current war in Ukraine is absolutely excellent. And this is from a series of tweets he did about fatigue, which I thought was particularly useful. He said that forces in attack can only last about four or five days because the people get tired. Um, units you know, beyond that, if they're not rested, they will begin to fail. And commanders actually make bad decisions after about three days with little or no sleep. And this is really about movement and sleep but also about the emotion in fighting. And it's you know less to do with the equipment and the supplies and the ammo. And the game really works well in capturing that. Uh, I've worked out the statistics around how long can you maintain high tempo operations. By high tempo, I'm assuming that you're having two activations with an attack in one of them, then the first one, and then some engagements or attacks by fire or a lot of movement in the second one, okay? So if you have this, which is a kind of common thing, then this is what's gonna happen. At the start of each activation, you are probably gonna start fresh. 
on activation two, and this is actually only a 50-50 chance, you, you know, for the benefit of the doubt, you're going to start fresh again, but by turn one, you're most likely to go down to a zero, turn three down to a one, turn four, because of the, the way that these stats work out, you still should be on a one, but then quickly go down to a two, and by the second activation of turn five, you should have reached three fatigue. And that's, I think, a really helpful planning exercise that you effectively have four and a half, or if you want to continue attacking at fatigue three, five uh, days worth of high tempo operations where you can maintain this sequence. And you say, well, what happens if I attack in both activations? Well, it just tightens it up. Instead of five-ish days, four and a half, five-ish days, you go down to four days if you attack in both activation one and activation two, assuming you can get activation two, of course. And, you know, if you're just gratuitously unlucky in your roles, you might have only three days worth of activations before you fatigue out and need to recover. Thinking about that, I think, is really helpful, particularly when you look at the map on turn one and wonder, what am I going to do? Because on turn six and seven, you need to be thinking about which formations am I going to rest, where am I going to rest them, and whilst I'm resting them, who's going to take over as point? You could say, well, I mean, what if I try and push it out a bit? What if I only have one activation with one attack sequence and don't normally go for a second activation? Well, you just push out the sequence. Um, it now becomes an eight-day kind of thing. And for some of your good but not excellent divisions, putting them onto a medium tempo might be a wise thing to do. It also might be wise to put one or two of your formations onto a medium tempo so that they continue to attack in turns six and seven whilst your excellent formations are recovering. And then... <laughs> The questions I always find myself asking, and my friends, how long can I reasonably expect to stay fresh? So again, using my notional example of two activations, a turn, one with combat, one with not, then you get this kind of sequence. So, you know, already on activation two, you're only on a, a one in two chance, one in three by turn, beginning a turn two, if you're still active on the third turn, that's a one in 10 chance, you know, you're doing super well. You're getting increasingly fluky as you go down to uh, silly numbers. If you attack in both the first and the second activation where you just squish those in and it just becomes straightforward doubles, uh, two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64 and on. Realistically, half the time, you're only going to get one activation of fresh. I mean, unless you don't do anything with that formation. A second activation at fresh is good fortune, rather than having one activation at fresh being bad luck. What do we take away from this little discussion? Well, first of all, you need to decide the operational tempo of your formations. Do you want high tempo operations lasting four or five days, followed by two or three days of rest back to fatigue zero? Do you try a moderate tempo of operations, which could last eight or maybe nine days, again, followed by rest? Do you use the two in combination so that you don't have to have a full operational pause after four or five days? If you do decide on an operational pause, where are you going to do it? How are you going to manage that? For awful divisions, what can you reasonably expect from them, given that they're fatigued? You know, are you going to throw the dice on the off chance that they can knock off a partial and in a partial be able to do something, but then run the risk of becoming more fatigued? Or are you struggling against some ghastly game-specific negative modifier? I'm thinking of the Italians in Brazen Chariots who have a minus three on most of their divisions. 
And then remember that you can reasonably only expect to stay fresh for one day. You know, if you get to day two, after two activations fresh, you're doing very well. That's the first takeaway. What's your operational tempo? The second one is what mission are you going to order your formations to conduct? So to bring it back to our discussion of Crusader, these five ones, the first one, protecting the flank of 13th Corps, moving to City Omar, and then round to Brook. So the advantage of this is that you're combining the power of your two cores into one thing. I guess the disadvantage is that you're introducing an extra dog leg into your journey <laughs> into Tobruk, making it the longest. Second one, just piling in and defeating Dak in a giant tank slug. Well, you know, I'd love to see it done. Uh, it sounds really chancy. Third option, occupying City Ridge. Um, yes, you're using the terrain and you're using prep death and you are giving Scoby in Trebrook an opportunity to tack out and release that uh, offensive force because they're not insignificant. Number four, going via Arieti uh, up the shortest route has some benefits. The South Africans come on behind so that you're leaning into the South Africans if you go through Route 4. And then the fifth choice, uh, Cunningham, the commander of the 8th Army's initial choice, was just to get here and sit on prep def and see if the deck is hard enough to come and take you on. I'm not going to say what my favourite is out of these because they all seem quite poor in their different ways. I guess my choice would have been to structure the 8th Army a little bit differently from how it was structured. But this, this is the game that you're offered, so what an exciting choice to have. To take another example over in Baptism by Fire. Here you have Kasserine, uh, the opening to the campaign, and the Germans who start have these four Brecken, uh, so what are they going to do? All the stuff that Carl Fung said about the 7th Armoured in terms of the vulnerability and fragility of that formation are also true here. You know, the sequencing is really hard. They're tiny, tiny little battle groups. Looking at them, Shoot is really quite small. It's got a tank, a limited AV, and a infantry. It's kind of well-rounded, but small. So it's fine in attack. Stenkov is only a reconnaissance and an infantry, so really it doesn't have any great depth, so I would use it for exploiting and screening. Ryman is a breakthrough AV, the Tigers, plus a limited AV, plus uh, some infantry, so you know, absolutely use them as the uh, the hard nose of your breakthrough. And then Gerhardt is a red AV, a tank with some infantry and some inferior pioneers who are kind of okay in attack and in follow-up. So if we think about mission priorities, in this opening phase, we want to uh, capture Sibila, which is uh, off the map, and neutralize CCA. The units here, here, and here, Drake's task force, have special rules applied to them. And if we drive off CCA, they will essentially be marooned. So number one is to directly attack, particularly the HQ, and push it back, and ideally get a second activation and push it back further. Choice two is obviously to just go beetling up the whole Highway 13, making sure that you probably want to garrison Kearns Cross and Poste de la Suda to stop any monkey business there, because they are particularly interesting spots for the Americans to Thirdly, you might want to look at seizing control of Highway 1 to 5. There, just off the map, is a German supply source, which would be good to have and open up a, an advance from the south. Fourthly, you're really looking to isolate this task force Drake. So long as CCA's HQ is far enough away, these guys can't move. 
because there's a special game specific rule that says in this hex they are in command and you can't deliberately move out of command so they can't move to the next hex where they would be out of command there's no need to go and attack these units in fact that's folly because if you attack them and get a retreat well they'll go and retreat back to the hq so leave them be and then fifthly, as an option to think about in this early phase, is cut off the southernmost supply route. So in the southern part of the map, there are really only two supply routes. One is Highway 13 itself through Sabila, and the other is a series of tracks meandering across the southern edge of the map board. And if you go to 0402, you can cut off that as a supply source forcing the Americans to a northerly direction for all of their future supply in the uh, Lakef direction. That's how you might think about your opening move mission, but you may also want to think about how you are going to strategically win the game. You need nine or more for an active victory of these victory point hexes. You can go for this clump, this central clump, which are good for either way the, the victory conditions can go, and there are nine of them. But obviously towards the top here, they go straight into the teeth of allied reinforcements. You can go for the Kef on this side, which has five, or alternatively the Fabisa route on this other side. Now you don't know until turn six which of these two directions you're going to be given the choice to go to. And that presents itself with a number of possibilities. So I guess, number one, do you wait until turn six? Or number two, do you make an educated guess and go, right, we notice the Allies are very weak on Le Kef. We're going to go up Le Kef, capture all or most of those, and 50-50 chance we've got the right section. And if we've got the right one, we win. And if we've got the wrong one, well, we'll just have to redeploy forces around to the uh, Sabisa direction instead. Or option number three, do we concentrate on going in the middle and trying to go equally on both sides to see what we can pick up on the cheap? There is this ghastly game-specific modifier for the access. So Turn one, hooray, a plus one. But turns two, three, and four, a minus two snafu mod. First of all, that's going to really dampen down any enthusiasm for second activation because the chances are, at best, you're probably only going to get a partial with a minus two, particularly if they've lost their fresh status. So you're already into a reduced tempo of operations. And that's going to limit what seems like the remarkable gains you may have got on term one, reaching the Bila, typically. It's going to be heavy going for the next three turns. On turn six, Rommel comes along. He doesn't quite restore the good times of turn one, but he is able to significantly boost either the DAC or the 10th, the two or three Kampfgrappen for uh, the 10th Panzer Division, and notionally for the 21st as well, but the 21st is much, much weaker. This all completely changes or optionalizes how you want to think about what you can realistically achieve. What are you going to do on turn five when your initial forces are potentially exhausted from a reasonably high level of rations? This for me is what it kind of looks like, turn one, Mainly full activations, 50% chance of fatigue, two-thirds chance of a second activation. Two, three, and four. You've only got a one inch four chance of being fresh by this point, so probably only one of your formations. If two of them are, you're you're doing well. Probably a lot of partial activations, and unlikely to want to do second activations because of the snafu penalty. You do get a couple of new units, so Lang on turn three, Dak on turn four, and they may well lead some of that. Gerhardt leaves on turn four, so good news for Gerhardt is you can run him into the ground. He does come back later at a minus one, um, so it's a bit of a gift there. Turn five, 
you have a sort of neutral turn and it's kind of where you're at to, you know, how much fatigue have you suffered uh, and how lucky do you get? But you may be able to push forward a little bit more speedily on turn five. And six, seven, eight, nine, and 10, you finally learn which way of your victory conditions you are set to go. You get Rommel boosting one of your divisions and that probably puts the main effort on Rommel, plus Gerhardt returns minus one. You might want to rest him or might not uh, on turn six, and Centro on seven and eight. In rough terms, high tempo turn one, medium tempo in two, three, and four, highish on turn five, and it just varies for the remainder of the game with Rommel-based units on a high tempo and everything else probably on a medium tempo of operations. I think that's for me, at least, that's a really useful way of thinking about how can I realistically challenge my formations to do some stuff. And it might change your view as to which of these routes you should do. I certainly feel that the chancing your arm route and exploiting the weakness, particularly I think around the Kef, is a uh, is a good option. Hoping, fingers crossed, that it's the one that turns up. Takeaway number three, keep to a mission-focused rhythm. So we explored the sequence of play. You need to think about your orders in the pre-turn phase, probably the most single, most important activity you'll do. Think about what activations you want to choose or pick so that the orchestration goes well to achieve those objectives. Get lucky with your snafu. There's not much else you can do other than cross your fingers. Place your objectives thoughtfully and move your counters around as best we can, enjoying it as much as we do and seeing what uh, what gifts the combat brings us. And then thinking carefully, thinking very carefully about your second activation. Do you have something important enough to push your unit on and risk that one third chance of further fatigue? And the fourth takeaway for me is actually really pay attention to the game's specific rules. It's something I probably underplay or don't really notice that much. In Last Blitzkrieg, it's not too bad. You do get the German grief teams, uh, and this, for the Allies, awful minus two snafu mod, which includes uh, their bridges. Baptism of Fire has this turn-based one for the Axis, which really changes the dynamic, and the boost of Rommel coming in later. Brazen Chariots has a nationality-based snafu mod, so plus one for the German, plus Ariete, nothing for the British, and minus three for all the rest of the Italians. They're not really going to be able to do very much at all. And Rommel coming in from turn seven for the DAC. Hans's last stand changes it again. You get all sorts of snafu mods and second activation limits, depending on the activation type, and these are done by tier, and what's happened. So are they primary, secondary, surge, response, Budapest, reinforcement, or spoiled? So lots of nuances there. And then finally, Aracor is very even-handed. It's got nothing whatsoever as befits a uh, essentially a training game. For me, to sum up, successful command, successful keeping your eye on the prize and moving those formations around to achieve your objectives, involves deciding what kind of tempo you can have and for how long, setting some mission orders that are realistic, including when do you think you're going to have to rest and who's going to take over point when they do rest, keeping that mission focus rhythm throughout. You know, command isn't just a turn one activity, it's every single turn, and it will pay you dividends to not just carrying on doing what you were doing before. And then finally, accounting for some of these game-specific rules, which can really change the flavor of your options for the entire game. I hope you found that useful. Next up, I'm going to have a look at control using this same C3i lens, which I will have out soon. Uh, for everything else, thank you very much for watching. Stay safe, and I hope to see you next time.